Okay, we're into part two now. And we have some more questions for you here. There is an additional question, corollary to the question about demarchism. What is demar demarchy? And how is it not anarchy? Okay, well, anarchy, as I previously mentioned, is a style of government that the anarchists uh, uh, seek to implement, whereas demarchy refers to uh, a type of philosophical use of tactics in direct action. So when you do any type of insurrection um, that is uh, popular enough for people to want to get involved, that's demarchy. Um, you could say that Nelson Mandela before his arrest was doing a type of demarchy even. Um, so demarchy is something you, basically you declare demarchy, people either join or they don't, and if they don't, and if they do join, demarchy is right then and there. It's, 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 it's the rule of the democratic argument against the status quo in the moment. So it's not really a style of government. It's, it's, it's more like controlled spontaneous, cons controlled spontaneous, action by those that propose it and those that are receptive to it that you know seek how to go about it in the democratic process which is not done through legislation that's why it's demarchy hmm. so a democratic process is a revolutionary process essentially yes Demo a revolutionary democratic process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's rosa luxemburg who wrote about this as well saying that uh Democracy was degenerating under capitalism. Capitalism was not capable of preserving democracy. More people are figuring that out. It's it's still taking a while, but like it's very hard to get that message across in the first world, particularly. Yeah, yeah. Because of the Cold War of propaganda in which socialism was uh, considered to be, or communism was considered to be the opposite of democracy. Hmm. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. Yeah. Now, what about uh, communitarianism and unionism in, in, a, in a demarchist uh, perspective? How would you describe communitarianism and unionism? Well, um, currently right now, there is a very great example of uh, communitarianism uh, through the uh, Grand District of PSFM. Um, a district is an entire. Yeah, you have to tell people what PSFM means. I, I, know, I, I know. Okay, PSFM refers to the People's Social Freedom Movement, um, which most people don't know what it's about because there's been a lot of sabotage to its reputation, and the original blogs that talked about it got hacked, and they're still. They're working. not important. Tell us what it is. All right. Well, what it is is that uh, okay, the People's Social Freedom Movement um, is the actual originator of the concept of patriotic socialism, which in it. The rendition of it is the white man applies to the Native American for citizenship, but it's a, it, it's, it's way more detailed than that. But um, they utilized, uh, out of all Demarchists, the patriarch socialists utilized communitarianism those. And communitarianism would mean like you get enough desperate people who are clear-headed enough to join together mutually to operate within the neighborhood. And that means loyalty to the collective and not to the state, the market, or anything other than that. So communitarianism is, as the namesake speaks of communitarianism. Unionism is cooperative insurrection. It's when you build cooperatives for the sake of ins popular insurrection. So like if you're in capitalism, you kind of have to have a cooperative. A real union is gonna be a cooperative. And a real shop steward is an author, not a leader. The, the shop, it changes. So the Demarcus view of, 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 of unionism changes the whole definition of a, of, a, of a shop steward. A shop steward is no longer a guy, you know, that you go to that's in charge, you know. No, a shop steward is a guy that writes the literature. There is no, because I, if you really think about it, a cooperative, a union, a proper union shouldn't have any official management unless it's a broad management because of seniority and, you know, trainees would come to their same level just upon learning more. And, you know, that's how, that's how unionism is done on the Demarchist, you know, side of things. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain as well the concept of uh, cosmopolitanity? Cosmopolitanality. Yes. Yes. Well, okay. So, yeah, cosmopolitanality uh, refers to uh, the participation in cosmopolitan law. 
you know, and cosmopolitan law, cosmopolitan law refers, you know, to uh, uh, natural human laws, which were active and much more prevalent before the rise of Western civilization, you know, and um, cosmopolitanality in its shortest rendition refers to the recognition of the other. And this requires not, you know, um, you know, not judging someone even upon their class. And yet here's the irony of cosmo cosmopolitanality. That's the big one that seeks to abolish class division. So you don't judge anybody because you don't know their background, but once they start showing more and more bourgeois tendencies or even aristocratic tendencies, that's, that's, that's when you kind of know who you're dealing with. Because ideologically, there are people that have more wealth that may be on the side of the poor. So cosmopolitanality is basically the rec the comp not just the recognition of the other, but it's, it's basically the war against assumptions for the sake of yourself and the other. Oh. Um, there's another concept. Uh, could you explain the concept of world transcendentalism? World transcend transcendentalism. That's uh, yeah. Okay, so it's called world transcendentalism because if you just said transcendentalism, people would confuse it with the American version of the same word, which is completely divorced. So world transcendentalism is the idea of basically re removing the social norms throughout the world of secularism and replacing it with itself. And, and the way that this works is that it, it starts from this uh, premise. Secularism has nothing to do with free speech or coexistence. It's a post-Christian concept. It's completely post-Christian in nature. And it is now spread to non-European countries you know, throughout the world. And it, it, it's a terrible misnomer. So like you could be a Buddhist but if you pick up secularism, you're actually picking up Christian ideas, whether you realize it or not. Hmm. You know, um, so for instance, uh, you and I come from Jewish backgrounds, but how many the secular Gentile and this must be about your Judaism, you know, like no religion in here. You know, even though much of their own stuff are going to be from a Christian background and Christian influences. You mean like the so world of, transcendent of France? Uh of uh, prohibiting by law the uh, hijab uh, hair scarf that uh, Muslim women wear. Secularism in a nutshell. Yeah, that's uh, exclusive secularism in which uh, there's only uh, one religion that sort of can present itself <laughs> because they make an exemption for the people who are wearing little uh, golden crosses. Well, um, there's secularism, which is a practice and then there is secular, which is a verb. And that's another thing that I should I should point out. I just hope that. Yeah, there's also uh, inclusive secularism in which all religions have equal status. All right, well, I know that there's different concepts of, of secularism, but typically the Demarcus position is secularism is secularism is secularism and it must be abolished. So I, if you see, this is capital, the, the ideological concept, and this is the verb. So you could have secular stances and it doesn't mean you favor secularism. Mm, yes. So like the, the lowercase verb secular, you mm. know? Yeah. It's more to yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, secularism with capital S is uh, like, a, has an ideological connotation to it. Yeah. Uh, and it uh, is used as a, uh, rationale for the abolition of national identity, particularly the national identity of minority populations. <laughs> All of a sudden you're yep. supposed to be uh, assimilated and become like the norm, you know, like <laughs> in France, if you don't wanna, if you wanna become a citizen, they even ask you, you know, to change your first name, <laughs> to be, you know, like a typical French name. <laughs> see, and see, that's the thing, you know, secularism is full of post-Christian neuroses, ultimately. That's ultimately what it is. Yes. You know, it, 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 and many people think, oh, well, I enjoy these secular freedoms. Are you sure those are secular freedoms or just democratic freedoms? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's basically, a, you know, secularism equals cultural genocide, no matter what version of it it is. It ultimately is that. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's sort of incredible, you know, like it's like the, uh, the joke about the person who considers that their particular region of the earth has no accent and everybody else does. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's really funny because if you say you don't you don't agree with secularism, people immediately assume that you're for theocracy. But that's these. That, that's another thing about world transcendentalism. World transcendentalism is about destroying the binary thought pattern that most of us suffer with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's not real. The binaries don't exist the way we think they do. You know, like, for instance, we are definitely the far left. However, the far left is still a dangerous label because what happens when the left wins? Is there still a left or a right? I mean, it's it's just, you know, there, there are questions to be asked about the terms we use when any left, when any leftist, especially somebody of the genuine far left, enters into any geopolitical discussion, we tend to use words that are off-putting to people. And this is another thing of, that world transcendentalism seeks to correct: is is respect the nuances, start studying the nuances, and understand what so, somebody may say something, like they're defending private property, but are they? Are they? Or they think that they're defending private property? They might just be defending their personal property. And I've noticed communists never explain to people what private property even is. Yeah, right. They you think know, that it's personal property. Books. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you're a political activist as well in Arizona. Arizona is uh, one of the most difficult uh, uh, regions, you know, to be um, active in, of course, and uh, can be s considered to be a harbinger of what is going to be happening to the United States as a whole. And in uh, Arizona, you basically have various episodes of some like civil war that are happening there between the so-called left and right with uh, the right having uh, been uh, able to successfully uh, infiltrate the uh, two police departments of uh, Phoenix and Glendale. What's happening to that, uh, that condition now? How is it going? The right wing is still in the departments of uh, Phoenix and Glendale, and they'll remain there because that's systemic to the nature of the police force itself. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the police have, since 2020, been forced to severely decrease, and as a result of that, they've had to hire new people with no background checks, and we already know what kind of people they're hiring. Um, to hide the racism that is so systemic to both Glendale and Phoenix and the, and the police departments, they are hiring middle-class black people now who tend to be radical liberalism they tend to be on that side hmm. in fact came across the black cop recently and you know he for whatever reason wanted to speak to me and i spoke to him and i was very nervous you know um and i really sh shouldn't have said too much and, and i didn't say anything compromising but i i tried to hold my temper in because he started speaking about muslims and how important it is that we do go to war with the Middle East so that we can force LGBTQ rights on them. <laughs> That's the reason. <laughs> That's radical liberal logic. It's it's inverted <laughs> fascism. That's what it is. It's not even yeah. really liberal. And it's fascist. It's just the inverted. It's the new inverted version of it. Uh -huh. Wow. You know, it, it's like I'm not for liberalism, but radical liberalism is not even liberal. If we're going to be honest about it. Yeah. It, it, you could call it. Progressive fascism without the demagogue principle. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean that that's that's a contradiction in itself. But you know, it's... Mm -hmm. but uh, Arizona has uh, legalized marijuana. That's yes. like a rad liberal yeah. thing to do, right? No, that's a cultural thing. The rad libs just take the credit for it. They take the credit for everything. They take the credit, you know, for gay marriage, you know, Obama tried to take care. No, that was years and years of people lobbying, mm -hmm. you know, about like, uh, about pointing out the hypocrisy of Western democracy and said, so you say this, 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 this should apply too. And they had no measure against it because it made sense. It was logical legalizing gay marriage. Yeah. Um, but the, the overturning of Roe versus Wade scares the crap out of me. I think that's going to lead to the criminalization of homosexuals. I think we are headed to our, towards a Nazi style government. We'd better get ready because... Yeah, that was a surprising fascistic win there. Yeah. And uh, but uh, Biden is trying to sort of make himself, you know, look good for the elections by having uh, issued an executive order to legalize marijuana in uh, federal jurisdictions and uh, supposedly is going to be releasing, you know, all the prisoners who are convicted on that basis. Yeah, Biden, Biden is and he's already showing like war hawk tendencies that you didn't even see from Trump. Yeah. But so progressive in his rhetoric, he fools people because people are hope junkies when it comes to the voting process. This is why I'm against voting, period, in, in any West, especially a settler colonial country, because it never does anything. I mean, 
if people wanted a third party option, the only option they really would have is the Green Party. But you have to get past not rad libs, actual liberals in there first. Hmm. And you speak about the fact that the people have the right to, to, to resist through firepower, which they do. They don't want to hear it because they're not the far left. It's the far left that champions gun rights and, you know, um, self-defense. Yeah, if, because yeah. they're not being threatened. That's why <laughs> they don't care. Right. Exactly. I mean, 90 percent of. Are, 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 are labor aristocrats, actually. So, mm -hmm. you know, if the first world labor labor aristocracy is actually the most dangerous class in the world. Like I would even say it's more dangerous than the first world bourgeoisie, you know, because their ambitions are very, very high. Mm -hmm. um, and they align also with the uh, first world petty bourgeoisie, which is fanatical, actually, it, especially if you compare it to the regular bourgeoisie, like the petty bourgeoisie in the first world is fanatical. You know, always nationalistic. I like, I mean, and, and, and um, you can see that in Canada too. And, the, you know, not just the United States, like very, I mean, I've also noticed the majority of uh, people who deny climate change are in the first world petty bourgeoisie. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, I'm concerned about your condition there under the, uh, the repression to be found in Arizona. And uh, I wish you and the others well. And uh, especially for the Navajo Nation, which yeah. is uh, faced with a big uh, challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, comrade number three sends his love to everybody. Um, he's very busy. He's very hard to contact. Sometimes he contacts me. And uh, but he he's been happy to hear that the grand uh, the grand sector of PSFM is a full and swing neighborhood that operates under communitarianism and the principles of patriotic socialism actual Patrick socialism, not not uh, Caleb Maupin's Duganite bastardizing of it. Yes, but, please uh, elaborate on that, you know. Uh, there's a lot of people, you know, who have uh, uh, followed, you know, uh, the uh, the reports, you know, the correspondent reports you know, of Caleb Moped on the Russia Today uh, uh, news broadcasts, uh, which are still available on the internet, you know, everywhere even if they're banned and censored, you know, from television. Uh, it's sad that he is, he is because he's actually a pretty good correspondent. He's very, he's very precise about things. But like, I just regret that I didn't investigate him at all. I, I, I could have investigated him, but I, I didn't. And as time went by and I started um, giving assistance to Jason Under as he gave uh, us press assistance that we needed, um, I started seeing the golf more and more and then they finally split you know then he had made accusations on jason and stuff like that but caleb moppin we know we there's even i i don't know the details and the details of dugan's actual fascism i um the the, the really good solid stuff that is out there on that is in the psfm uh, archives but i have access to the psfm archives but what i do recall is that um dugan's um, followers on Facebook used to shut down everything uh, related to PSFM. They like false reports and stuff like that because they were terrified about the pe about the people that they had hijacked this from, you know. Um, and that ties into the fourth positionism, which actually goes back to 1944 by the, Na uh, the North Northern Native Americans uh, came up with that term, fourth position, and fourth way politics. Uh, because I mean, I, I don't want to offend our communist friends, but especially if we're talking about the Navajo and the Hopi, a lot of them consider um, uh, communists to be fascists in denial. You know, and I would not agree with that. And comrade number three would not agree with that. But this is, this gets back into the thing, why the 9-11, sorry, why the non-alignment movement happened in the first place. And that's because, you know, communists are correct largely about what they're saying, but they have a language that does not appeal to people at all. You know, and they they tend to not if they were so accurate, why don't they say the truth that the opiate of the masses and the sigh of the oppressed of a, of a soul and a soulless society is entertainment. That's the opiate entertainment. Mm -hmm. It is always the opiate. And communists will not say that because most communists are entertainment junkies. <laughs> and I, that was the I essence of the whole uh... art, but hippie movement in the 60s that I witnessed, you know, because the hippieism, you know, was basically a hedonistic, you know, strategy, you know, in which they uh, developed a culture which was so appealing 
that all the new generation were supposed to, you know, uh, drop out, not, you know, adopt the, uh, the functions, you know, uh, of their father and uh, let the system collapse, you know, because of the lack of, you know, popular support, <laughs> only it didn't work. Of course it didn't work. It was completely utopian. In fact, this is my, this is why I hate the, the weather underground so much is because nobody championed that hippie message. I mean, who championed that message more than the hippies themselves? The weather underground smash monogamy let's have orgies that's revolutionary mm. you know um claim that we're supporting the black panther party meanwhile fred hampton denounces you i mean it's just... yeah fred hampton it wasn't even allowed to use their printer in the office <laughs> yeah no it's and it, it, it's kind of obvious that they were fusing anar um not anarchists i would say petty bourgeois anarchist and trotskyist ideas and trying to pass it as mal as proto maoism basically which uh, that didn't really work because I'm because I mean Fred Hampton and the entire ring were so much more real. Mm -hmm. I I mean I'm not saying everything that the Weather Underground did was wrong or, or more like what every not everything they said was wrong, but their actions didn't have one single result except that the far left is terrorist. That's what that result what their shit resulted in. They didn't save anybody. They didn't do any revolution. They just blew up buildings and they warned people that they were going to blow up buildings like a terrorist would. It's just. Mm. They are proof to me that terrorism is a useless tactic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it didn't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, tell us, you know, what is the uh, relation between Buddhism and pantherism? Okay, well, pantherism is a, I wouldn't call it a methodology because I, I'm going to go by what Panther Code says it is. It's a method. It is the, it is the method of the United Front in the settler colonial countries, the first world in general, but especially the settler colonial countries, decolonization becomes the primary principle of anti-imperialism through pantherism. So pantherism also means st the study of Eldridge Cleaver, uh, Fred Hampton, uh, Bobby Seale, young Bobby Seale, like, like when the Panthers exist, when he was in the Panthers, uh, Huey P. Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, Kathleen Cleaver, um, e even H. Trap Brown um, and uh, and uh, Stokely Carmichael, but it also means study the American Indian movement. It does it so. Pantherism does not mean Black Panther Partyism. It means just that Pantherism. And Dr. Uh, Huey P. Newton as well, in terms of intercommunalism. Yes, I mentioned that, and, and that's another thing. Proper Pantherism, particularly Black Pantherism, like I said, when I'm saying Pantherism or Black Pantherism, I, I'm not saying Black Panther Partyism. I'm talking about an actual method. Um, the, the, um, if you can tell precisely Black Pantherism synthesizes Eldridge Cleaver with Huey P. Newton a lot, you know, um, so it lifts up the, uh, uh, Black Liberation Army as doing the correct actions at the time, not Huey, but it lifts up Huey for having a sharp theory about, you know, um, what, a, you know, what, what is supposed to lead into a post- colonial society. The problem is, is that people think that there's a, there's a contradiction between New Africa and intercommunalism, but there isn't, not according to Panther Code, you know, and I'm not allowed to say too much about Panther Code. I'm not in Panther Code. I don't qualify to be in Panther Code, but what I am allowed to tell people is they're a lot bigger than people realize they are, and they're starting to show themselves, and people are shocked. It's like, people have been telling you that these guys have been out here forever, and now you're shocked that they have always been here? I mean, it's... Hmm. And by here, I don't mean Arizona, I mean in the country of the United States. Isn't it surprising how Buddhism and Pantherism mesh so closely together and they both are a reflection of their national revolutionary political culture? Uh, not surprising to me. Like, I, I, um, because, I mean, at first it was surprising, but I, just, just think about it. Okay. The United Front, Rainbow Coalition. Hmm. The direct references to the Jewish people in the Warsaw Ghetto in the 10-point program, what was the majority of partisans? Not Zionist, they're Bundist. And usually if you're finding non-Bundists, they were either Marxist or anarchist, typically. Very few Zionists were interested, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the thing is, is that because the Bund... I mean, the simple truth is whether people are like it or not, Bundists and Bolsheviks were not fair to each other. Historically, they had never been fair to each other. And, you know, um, you know, the Panthers, uh, proto prototypically, they were Maoists, but at the time, you know, they were called Marxist-Leninists. And, you know, from that logic, the Bund is already rejected, yet their praxis is all Bundist. Mm -hmm. And that's what we know historically. That's one of the reasons why 
a lot of people don't like Panther Code. Panther Code said, no, this conclusion from the Buddhist movement was correct. You know, and it's just the parallels. They're, 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 they're so obvious there. When you think about what the Black Panther Party was doing, that's exactly what the old uh, Jewish uh, labor boon was doing. And while you have post-Black uh, Panther Party theorists now who are in, involved themselves in pantherism to correct mistakes, we are now doing the same thing with Boondism. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, yes, the boon good, but there were these mistakes that the boon made that we got to deal with now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say one of them is to stop looking for a secular answer and start looking for more of the world transcendental answer. Uh -huh. and, and stop saying that Yiddish is dying. It's not that Yiddish is dying. I, what's it called? Um, because Hasidic uh, Yiddish isn't dying. What's dying is the uh, I think it's called the, the, the it's the, the what if there's a word for it, the secular Yiddish. That's what's dying. And one thing that Donna Newman did prove was like enough of it survives that we can build a new an all new Yiddish. All you need is the surviving Yiddish, both Western and Eastern, uh, whatever you can of that. Aramaic, Russian, and German, and you could completely resurrect Yiddish. And, and that's true. That's actually true. That's all you would need. You would just need an understanding of Polish, Russian, uh, uh, really you don't need the Polish per se, but it's, it's useful. Mm -hmm. uh, Russian, German, Ar and Aramaic. And, and you, with that, you can, and if you take the old, uh, both Eastern and Western secular Yiddish and Hasidic Yiddish, if you, if you put them up, you can actually resurrect Yiddish. A lot easier than what the Zionists did to resurrect Hebrew, actually, way oh, more yeah. easier. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's just that I think that that's what I think that that's why we're why we're so repressed. Actually, is because they know that we we have those intentions. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, yes. Um, you know that uh, my first language is not even English or French. My first language is Yiddish because I was born to uh, uh, refugee uh, parents, both of whom came from Poland by way of the uh, Wetzlar refugee camp. And because they didn't speak English, you know, they spoke with me in Yiddish, you know, not Polish, because we were in Canada, Toronto. So my first language is Yiddish, you know, and then uh, I really uh, lack the uh, political culture of Yiddish and Yiddishkeit, you know, because um, most of the uh, Yiddish speakers, you know, were killed off by the Nazis or Yiddish was suppressed, you know, by the Zionists thereafter. So I feel like, you know, like I... I can't speak anybody with anybody and in my own my own language. So I'm going to speak some Yiddish with you, Comrade Net, and I'll translate it afterwards, you know, but uh, let's conclude, you know, with a bit of Yiddish here. And I, I would have this to say to you and to all, which is Nozmir Leben, Sinainem, Netzeichel, Shitfis, and Shulam. So I'll, I'll translate that for you. It says, let us live together with uh, cycle. It's sort of a Yiddish version of wisdom. Uh, Shitvis is reciprocity. And Shulam, of course, is peace, like the Hebrew Shalom. So it's like the uh, Yiddish, Yiddishized, you know, like Hebrew word, which, uh, you know, Yiddish does a lot. So there we are. And uh, I think that uh, we will succeed because the logic, you know, compels people to adopt a position which recognizes uh, national identity as distinct from the state and distinct from nationalism. So we're nearly coming to the end of our time on the uh, part two here. And I would thank you very much, you know, for explaining very well, you know, the concepts, you know, that are ingrained in the people's social freedom movement and in Buddhism and Pantherism. And I expect that people will find this of great interest because we're able to accomplish things that are not uh, done by any other political tendency. And in fact, uh, goes beyond the sectarianism of the political formations that have existed previously. So I'd like to congratulate you on your work uh, in that measure. And uh, we will return. Right on.